Oh, I see. All right, go ahead. Going live. Got one. All right. Look at us. Our numbers are flying up to nine, ten. Okay, dope. Well, we'll give it another minute while people uh, kind of filter in. Adam, is it like winter there in Atlanta with the fire going behind you? It's all, it's all about the effect. It's <laughs> <laughs> you got your coat on, you got the fire going. The white leather chair is also. I, outside. I have been. I have been kicked outside, so it does. It is cooling down. Well, you're outside. Bit, yeah. Oh, that's cool. I get it. I, I don't know. Show them the patches, Adam. You know, eight. Oh, I got the, I got the patches. Come he's, on now. He's, he's <laughs> professorial. <laughs> you know, if you don't have anything to say, you just have to look good, right? <laughs> oh, boy. You said it was cases and cocktails. I thought this would be the appropriate venue. I, I feel good about it. I do. Um, all right. Well, I think people are still kind of filtering in. Maybe we'll, it's just turned six o'clock, maybe we'll, or six Pacific, uh, nine Eastern. So why don't we give it another 30 seconds or a minute and then we'll get going here. Um, yeah. All right. Well, let's get started. So, uh, for those who have just joined, thanks so much for coming to our second Cases Over Cocktails. This is a, a, a co-sponsored program we're trying to do at UW and, and, uh, and at Columbia once a month, um, just focusing on a topic, getting some experts together to chat about it, and um, as if we're, you know, I don't know, at a, at a cocktail lounge at, at some meeting in person chatting about whatever is the challenge of the day. And so today we wanted to focus on transcatheter mitral valve replacement. And I uh, was really lucky to have a couple, three uh, experts uh, willing to join. We've got uh, Adam Greenbaum from Emory, uh, Brian Wisenant from uh, Intermountain Health in Salt Lake City, and Christine Chung uh, from here at University of Washington in Seattle. So thank you all for joining. Um, having us, Jamie. <laughs> I would so for for those who have uh, who are are listening in from home, there is a Q and A button at the bottom. Um, feel free to use that. Uh, unfortunately, just to sort of make the to orchestrate things a little bit more cleanly, you're you're all muted. But um, the Q and A works. We're monitoring that, and we're happy to sort of um, to address questions as they come up. But the idea here is to just uh, as a format go through a couple of slides of data because we've got experts and it's worth getting their opinion. And then just let's dig into a bunch of cases um, that I've kind of thrown together and get everyone's opinion on how to, how to do it better, how to do it right, what, what have you. Um, all right. So with that, let me share my screen here, if I can share screen. Um, this guy and Hopefully you're seeing that now. Let's go here. Um, all right, are you seeing the uh, prep screen or the full screen? Full screen. All right, perfect. So um, I was gonna ask Christine to just kind of go over some of the data that exists. You know, if you guys would chime in um, based on, you know, what you're thinking about these data, I would, I would love it. Sure. So um, large scale registry data has only relatively recently been collected. Um, so beginning about five to six years ago. Um, so one of the initial analyses of uh, a significant cohort of data was from 2019. Um, where they looked at 40 centers across the US and Europe um, and analyzed some of these early experiences with valve and valve, valve and ring, and valve and MAC. Um, and you can see that um, mortality rates were relatively high across all three cohorts of patients, but in general um, were lowest for valve and valve. Um, and then the intermediate group was valve and ring and mortality was highest for the valve and MAC group. And it tracks um, to some degree with the risk of LVOT obstruction, which is the lowest in the valve and valve patients and highest in the valve and MAC. Next slide. All right, here we go. Eventually, I'm going to figure this out. There we go. Um, we skipped one. Nope, oh, my bad. 
Um, and then a year later, so this is from earlier this year, um, there was data published from the TVT registry. Um, so this cohort um, captures basically any anyone in the US that is doing a TMVR procedure. And so it's a less uh, selected, broader um, sort of uh, snapshot, if you will, of real world experience with TMVR. Um, and one thing I should mention as well is that the earlier study uh, had a very high proportion of uh, procedures that were done transapically. So about 60% were done transapically and only about 40 were, were done uh, via the transeptal route. Um, so in contrast, uh, the TBT registry data, um, so this only reported outcomes out to 30 days, but you can see that overall mortality rates are significantly lower, especially for the valve and MAC cohort. Um, but track, track more closely for the other um, two cohorts. And this paper also showed that uh, patients experience a significant improvement in symptoms and functional status, um, at least at 30 days. Brian, Adam, did you guys participate in that initial valve and MAC data that were, did you submit cases to that when the first slide? We did. Yeah. And were you doing them all transep, trans, apical, transeptal back then? You know, we did our first cases transapically. You know, when we first started doing TAVR, it was 2009, and this was in the partner trial. And we actually went up and talked to John Webb. And he was, they were kind of bullish about doing mitrals right from the get-go, vows and rings. And he was talking about it in the very early days. And so we kind of, we kind of were introduced to valve and valve, valve and ring as part of the TAVR procedure. And, and so in the early and this was how early on the John and, and the group in, in Vancouver felt like you know, they had some early problems with transeptal and early generation valves. And it was really because they were trying to anchor into the, the struts of the valve rather than the rings. Mm -hmm. But because of that, they moved quickly into a transapical. And so we did our first transapically, um, and that was about our first 10. But then once we started doing transeptal, we haven't gone back and we haven't done another transapical since then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Adam, similar story, or what, what about for you guys? Yeah, we went to, I mean, I think, uh, Brian, a lot of that issue early on was delivery, right? Because remember, the original Sapien was being mounted right onto the balloon, and obviously getting across the septum presented some issues. But really, since the XT and, and S3, certainly delivery through the septum becoming much easier, um, yeah, we haven't looked back from a transapical standpoint. I can't recall the last time we, we went transapical. Yeah, it's interesting because obviously all the newer technologies are the platforms of, are all starting transept, transapical again um, and struggling to figure out how to go transeptal. So there is, there may be still the need for that skill set, I guess, a little bit if you're going to, depending on how thing, how fast things evolve. Because um, I, I agree, I mean, it, it feels like the kind of thing that if you never do them, you know, you probably it's probably a bit self-fulfilling, but now all of a sudden you've got whatever other technologies that might need that. So I don't know. I don't know how that's going to play out. Um, anyway, uh, Christine, you want to... The technologies kind of think of transapical as being a transition procedure until they get transeptal figured out. I'm not yeah. sure that we're going to have a lot of long-term transapical procedures would be my guess. But I sure hope not. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, Christine, I hear there's some new data on valve and valves from some guy uh, published from <laughs> that in Utah. Um, uh, show us Yes, that. yeah. So the most recent data that we have, um, if you want to okay. show yeah, the next slide. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so this represents the most recent data that we have, um, including outcomes of including patients in the TVT registry up to 2019. Um, and you can see that at one year, uh, mortality rates are somewhere around 15 to 20% for transeptal and then 20% uh, for, for transapical. Um, and so it seems that at least for patients that are being done via a transeptal route, um, that out until one year, there are pretty good mortality rates, especially when you um, are comparing them to what is predicted based on their surgical mortality risk. Um, so these are generally patients that are considered high risk for surgery. Um, so these mortality rates are actually quite good. 
Um, yeah. But do you guys think now with with this next round of data and sort of continuous positive data, particularly in Valve and Valve, when when do you see a failing mitral prosthetic valve that you send back to sur to your surgeons for another mitral valve? Yeah, I'll comment on this data. Um, the the cardiovascular mortality was extremely low. And so the 30 day cardiovascular mortality was less than 2% for, for mitral valve and valve. And the, as Christine mentioned, the observed to expected ratio was about 50%. It was, it was really much less than the STS would predict. And the conclusion of this trial, which was as everything is always a carefully cra crafted and negotiated language uh, with the re reviewers and the editors. But what we finally settled on is that transcatheter valve and valve should be considered an option for most patients with failed bioprosthetic valves. And, and regardless, and that we actually had the language in the paper of regardless of surgical risk. And so, and that's kind of where we are in our practice and where we've been for a long time. And I think that's where the country should be. And this data supports that that valve and valve should be our first line therapy for most patients. And then we have to think about who the patients are, who we would exclude and, and go and uh, have surgery as a first line. Hmm. Now I will, uh, you know, I think one of our former outstanding fellows. Go for it, Adam. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Nori, Nori Kamioka actually was a fellow of ours last year for structural, actually looked at this, looked at the Emory data on those who went for valve and valve and compared them to those who went for redo surgery and found very similar outcomes um, in terms of mortality um, between the two. And in fact, um, everything looked pretty good to suggest that there really is no reason to go back to surgery. The gradients were slightly higher in the valve and valve transcatheter group, as you can imagine, because we're putting in a slightly smaller valve, but with the exception of that, they did just as well. So the conclusion from that, at least single center analysis was, was you know, valve and valve TMVR all the way. Yeah. Now, I will, I mean, I think it's worth noting that it's only a, what, half of the TAVR centers in the country have done TMVR, something like that. I mean, I, I guess there is this one lingering question about whether or not the outcomes are better because they're clustered at more experienced centers um, or not, right? I mean, every, the first time you do anything, you're not as good at it. Uh, so I, I guess that would be my only, my only wonder is, you know, is there, is there a bit of this that is a little too polished because it's stayed um, sort of cluster, you know, there's a whatever, a 1300 or 1200 surgical sites whose numbers for surgical mitral valves are not always great. And there's 350 centers that have done mitral valve and valve, something like that. Is that, those numbers sound right? You know, the, the mean number of procedures, the median anyway for this was about three per center. Oh, okay. And this was still very early in the learning curve um, for most centers. People have said, you know, maybe part of the reason why the results were so good is that a large, maybe a large number of these were proctored. And it's, it's kind of, there were a handful of centers who had done a lot of cases. And then there were a lot of centers who had onesies, twosies, and threes. And we still had very good results. So I think it's, it shows that it's a very doable procedure. Um, but, I, but perhaps having a, expertise in proctors and a lot of industry support uh, helped facilitate those good outcomes. Okay, cool. All right, let's get into cases. I think that's what people kind of wanted. Um, maybe before we do that, we can put up a co polling question about how many TMBRs um, the uh, the viewers have done over the last couple of years. Can we, if I could uh, ask John Michael to throw that polling question up, that'd be great. So feel free to answer. We'll give that um, we'll give that a, a, a minute or two. I can't believe I can't vote. What's going on? Um, we didn't make I apologize. Scale that. We'll, we'll let you vote next time, next round. Okay. We think we know your answer, though, Adam. Yeah. 
Fair enough. Um, and can you guys see the answers? Uh, the vote no. coming up or just me? I can't see the answer. Okay. So we've got 22% said zero, 33% said one to five, 30% said five to 10, 11% uh, 10 to 15, 6% said greater than 15. So pretty nice little bell curve. Um, all right, that, that's helpful. Um, and I actually have a question from the audience. Oh, okay. Um, so there's a question here. What is the longest durability for valve and valve TMVR that you all have in your anecdotal experience? And how concerned are you about long-term durability? Hmm. Interesting. I don't, uh, I'm just trying to think through the literature. I don't know that much has been published on long-term durability uh, in the, in the mitral space, though it's the same valve and same treatment. Um, I don't know. Do you guys imagine it's going to be meaningfully different in the mitral? I think it, it goes a little bit into the, maybe the question of anticoagulation. I would think that the shear stress would probably be less in the mitral position, but the risk of thrombosis may be a, a little bit greater. I certainly have a, hand, a number of patients who are out more than five years with great results still. Um, and I have not seen failures. I haven't, I don't think I've seen any, you know, early on we were doing some melodies um, before Sapien was FDA approved. And I have seen one melody that failed and we did a Sapien inside it, but I haven't seen any Sapiens wow. fail. So I, I, but I have seen them from both. Mm -hmm. uh, so that um, to me, the durability question is a little bit tied to anticoagulation, but overall I think they're going to be durable. Yeah. I guess I was going to save that for a little later, but since you teed it up, let's just go there. Um, what, uh, what are you doing in terms of post, post TMVR for anticoagulation? How long, what are you using? All that. We've been using, we've been using oral anticoagulation in everybody. Um, I still prefer Coumadin. We will uh, accept Eliquis, um, but those are really the only two we've been happy with. And we've been going with them for as long as the patient will can tolerate it. Hmm. Okay. How about you guys? And and just to just to pick on that thread a little bit, why specifically Eliquist and not the other DOAX? You can spell it. <laughs> well, that is true, um, but uh, based on some of the tatter the tatter literature, right? We're a little concerned about um, thrombosis. Maybe not as protective with some of the other agents, right? Gotcha. So we just translate it over to mitos with lower flow, right? Yeah. yeah. We've been using all the DOACs and Coumadin and um, keeping patients. A lot of them, fortunately, a lot of them have AFib already, and right. so they're on something, and then it makes it pretty easy just to continue what they're on. And and same as Adam, we try and keep them on anticoagulation as long as they'll tolerate it. And I always discuss that in advance of the procedure and tell them that we're going to suggest that they maintain anticoagulation as late as, as long as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, fortunately, if we need to interrupt it for surgery or something, we don't need to bridge. <clears throat> we don't, if, we use, if we're using Coumadin, an INR of two to three is sufficient. I generally don't use antiplatelet therapy with it, just anticoagulation. How about yeah. you, Jamie? What do you do? We've been anticoagulating as well. I have been very um, back and forth about direct which is the part that I've struggled with because uh, as you say a lot of these people have an obligate need for anticoagulation so that makes it easy but for those that don't um, you know the bleeding risk of these folks is not trivial M many of them they're they tend to be higher risk people and and I have I've gone back and forth and round and round and um, you know some of the the halt data on the TAVR side which is not directly applicable but you know, some of the partner three CAT scan, CT scan stuff has affected me a little bit that they, the folks who had halt at 30 days are not the same ones that had it at one year and vice versa. Um, and, and there may be some two year data also coming around about that. And um, so I just, I guess the argument is, yeah, you should leave it on it, leave them on it for as long as possible because when they might get thrombus is, really is completely stochastic. I mean, it's just random, but, um, but I also just worry about their bleeding risk. So I've said everyone has to be on it for three months. 
and I have no idea if we should stay on it longer or not. Um, that's what I've been doing for better or worse. John Michael, can you throw up polling question seven? Yeah. All right, let's get everyone else's vote. I think we've already poisoned the well on that one a little bit. We have, <laughs> that's all right. I think your point about the no um, antiplatelet agent is an interesting one though. We, we've really been walking away from antiplatelet agents in TAVR as well um, recently. I don't know what do you guys think about that, but. I think that's interesting. So will you do a TAVR with no, anti with no anticoagulation or antiplatelet? Yeah, I mean, we might use a baby aspirin for a month or something like that, but you know, the most recent data um, didn't really favor Plavix in any way. Certainly no role for DAPT. I think that's pretty clear. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, all right, well, it seems like most people are in the, a couple of folks use DAPT for in this scenario or aspirin alone, but most folks here, let me, Maybe you could post those results. We can't see them. Yeah, sorry. Uh, share results. Can you see them now? Yeah. Um, so, fairly consistent. Um, all right. So, let's do some cases here. Uh, oops, sorry. Um, this one was just a table setter. Not particularly fancy, but just to make sure we're all on the same page with a, a good old-fashioned valve and valve. Um, it's a 69 year old who's in the hospital for a long time um, and kind of on the MICU service and stuck on dobutamine. And I don't think they were really focused on his valves. End stage renal, he's got a 27 magna and a 33 magna in the tricuspid and mitral positions um, or mitral and tricuspid positions respectively. Um, and um, here is echoes that'll play. He's got his, um, one interesting thing about this guy uh, that I was going to sh show later, but I'll just bring up now. So this is his tricuspid, obviously. His paravalvular regurgitation, his, his right atrial pressure is so high that his paravalvular regurgitation is actually just paravalvular regurgitation. It's going forward, um, which is which I'd never seen before. Um, so that was pretty interesting. Mean gradient was 15. And then more moderate uh, MS, I think his gradient was like 9. Uh, with mild to moderate MR, but he was stuck in the hospital on uh, on dobutamine, and we figured we're just going to fix them both. Um, so, uh, so that's what we did. And I just this one is is um, these are just kind of laying out the steps, and then we'll get into more interesting cases soon. What are you guys using for transeptal crossing these days? Anything exciting? We typically. Um use a nagari or an agilis steerable catheter and then an estato 20 gram tip wire and we just electrify it as we do all our electrosurgical procedures so just 30 watts burn and then just push it across and it just saves us a lot of time and you're using the you're keeping the dilator in it the obturator i mean yes and do you feel that it can it can bend sufficiently with the with the uh, obturator in it yes the, you're talking about the Nagari or the Agilis? Yeah. Yes, yeah. for sure. Absolutely. It's pretty fancy using your electric wire. It's, no. it's, it's uh, not, it the, doesn't get electrified. In, in right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. So, and you could, you know, you could steer it and bend it where you want and, uh, and put it exactly where you want for, I'm sure we'll get into height and things like that. And so it gives us the ability to do that. So here Adam you are. Have a hole punch. He uses electrification for a hole punch. That's right. <laughs> we, we, just, we just use a uh, SOO and a Brock and Bro or just a regular needle and nothing fancy. Yeah. I started trying the Bayless VersaCross, which is a little bit spendy, but is is a really lovely little system with that. Um, the you know you electrify the wire. And then it has a pre-shaped loop on it, so you just it punches over, and then it immediately becomes a pigtail. I don't know. It's probably historically always just used an SL1 and a BRK needle, but trying to get with the times, trying to electrify stuff. Um, all right, we're um, 
I think I've got a slide on here. So the trend, the trans septal, the trans, uh, excuse me, the intraatrial septal crossing, really important for these cases, right? So where, where do you, and this picture, by the way, is not representative of anything except that it had a little grid on it. This is from Mark's old data, Mark Reisman. Um, where are you guys crossing? What do you think is important or not important? So I think it's important to be it. posterior, yeah. um, to give yourself as much room away from the valve as possible. And I like to not be too high because sometimes the coming down is, is problematic. So I kind of like posterior and a little bit on the lower side. Adam? Yeah, I agree. We sort of shoot for three to four, you know, maybe something like that, three centimeters above. And posterior, remember that you always... Um, as you come through from a transeptal approach, the tendency is going to be that the anterior is lower, right? So if you come across posteriorly, then you have the ability to sort of uh, try and prevent that, that malalignment in the anterior posterior projection. So I get it. I get posterior midline for sure. Yeah. Yeah. The, and uh, I, so these are obviously mitral clips, but just more examples of that, that the anterior puncture is definitely lower and it brings you not only sort of on this anterior rim, but um, but you just don't have as much space to to move around. Um, we we go um, we go posterior inferior, and I try and my thinking is that I want to spend as little time as possible in the right atrium. That you just kind of slide through there and straight back to the intraatrial septum. Because we've had a couple cases where we sort of end up sort of bowing in the right atrium a little bit, particularly if you catch a lip on that septum, boy, those those can really stink. Um, or at least for me, they can really, you guys can probably do it, no problem, but I struggle with those. And um, if that happens. And or bowing in the left atrium. I get bowing in the right atrium oh. because I can't even get to the left. You're good enough that you get to the left <laughs> atrium, then you can bow, fine. I can, I can bow anywhere. I can That's bow usually both sides. That's usually a sign that you're a little too superior, right? So it goes up right. too high and yeah. then it starts to go. That's, that's right. Superior. Yeah. So that's why I like posterior inferior and just get out of that right atrium and move along. That's my, that's my feeling. Um, but uh, anyway, it seems like I, for, for the few times that I have proctored these things, um, that seems to be a failure mode, right? It's the like kind of a little bit, more kind of cavalier crossing and you end up anterior and you're just hitting that anterior rim of the particularly for valve and valve like you can really bring the new valve down and bang into the anterior rim of that of the surgical valve and not necessarily get across i've seen that once um that was painful so any event john michael uh, can you put up the polling question number five uh, we keep, I'm sorry, we keep asking, we keep talking about it before we ask the question. So that's, maybe that's dumb, but let's see what everyone else does. What's your uh, septostomy balloon size of choice? Yeah, I tend to use a 12 unless it's a really thick post-surgical septum that I've been struggling with for some reason, and then I'll go to a 14. What do you guys use? Yeah, I'm pretty much the same. We use a 14 Armada or Fox Cross for almost all of them. Yeah, I use a 12 or 14, whatever the techs have pulled. <laughs> Fair enough. Sometimes uh, we mount, um, but do you guys mount your Sometimes when we mount it directly on the balloon instead of in front, so we don't have to do the, um, you know, the whatever the pullback and the lining up of the balloon, then then we'll actually use a fourteen for sure. What do you do, Adam? You mount it not outside the body. I think that's what he's saying. Yeah. You do. So right for some of the cases, if we're a little, maybe it's a lampoon or something where we think they're going to get a little unstable, and we want to just be able to run right through. Um, we will mount the valve directly on the balloon, like the old days, like the original right. Sapien, so it's not in front of it. And and you can do that right on the commander delivery system. Um, it goes through a 26 uh, Gore Dry Seal Flex, for instance. So don't use, you know, just use that instead of a uh, the Edward sheath. And then you can just drive right through. But if that's the case, since you know whatever, we'll we'll, we'll make sure it's a 14 balloon on the Sure, that makes sense. 
I have, um, I know you like the Nagari, Adam. I, I use the Direx, which is a Boston product, um, which I like because the obturator is, will take an 035 as opposed to an Agilis, which is an 032, which drives me nuts that they would do that. Um, one thing, I don't know if the other catheters will do this, but the, the most of the 12 and 14 millimeter balloons that we use will fit through the uh, central lumen of the direct. So we'll go up and cross with our directs and get our wire in. And then you can bring your balloon in straight through the directs and then kind of de-sheath the, the balloon. And then you never fight with getting across the septum ever, which I find it would happen every once in a while that you know the the balloon wouldn't go through the septum terribly well or it catches on the lip or something um but i have found that to be helpful it's just a, a little bit of a cheat and if that works with other steerable catheters or not i'll use a direct also <laughs> the other thing i'll do sometimes is after doing a transeptal crossing if if the septum seems particularly difficult to cross and rigid which we see occasionally Mm -hmm. Then I'll put a second wire in through my transeptal sheath. So I've got a buddy wire mm -hmm. and I, I back the system out so that I've got two vessels out of the leg and put my Edward sheath over one wire. And then I've got a buddy wire, just kind of use it as a cutting balloon a little bit. And if I really can't cross, then I can run another balloon up there and dilate a little bit more. Well, that's interesting. And that's another 035 balloon. Well, I'll just so leave the wire there. Yeah. But then if I use, if I need to put another, I'll just use it. Yeah, I just leave an extra stiff up in a pulmonary vein. And then if I need to, to dilate it further, I can put in an eight French sheath and use even like a, you know, just a small six, eight millimeter balloon or something as a buddy balloon. So that's if you need to dilate it further because the valve's not going. Yeah, just because every once in a while, the, I feel like the biggest, the, mo the most challenging thing for these procedures is when, it's hard to cross the septum with the valve, which yeah. doesn't happen that often, but it can happen. It can be really hard. Yeah. And, so, and usually you can predict it based on a hard transeptal mm -hmm. and when it's hard to get things across. And then I'll just leave that wire there to give me that bailout. It's interesting. I like that idea. I'm going to steal that. Um, okay. And then, so for this one, obviously valve deployment is per standard transcatheter mitral valve with a few millimeters ventricular to the posts is what we tend to do. Um, so this is just that. And, so, um, so talk about the position on that, Jamie. Yeah. yeah. Um, so why a little bit ventricular to the post compared to just even with the posts and leaving more in the left atrium? Well, I think you get better hemodynamic gradients the more you can flower pot it. It's obviously, you're obviously walking that line because too ventricular and it'll and the most catastrophic thing that can happen will happen which is that you lose the valve in the ventricle um and uh and f you know for those watching at home full disclosure i will show one of those just because it's good to for everyone to learn from my mistakes i guess but um but i think you want to flare the ventricular side as much as you can it not only anchors best since all the the pressure is from ventricle to atrium, so you want that ventricular side flared, but also I think it just gives you better gradients, right? I mean, that's been, the more hourglassy you are, I think the worse your gradients are. I don't know if you would agree with that, but that's what I, my experience has been. I'm not sure. Adam, how do you line it up? Do you do this? I, I do. We usually have it slightly more ventricular. Because in general, the, you know, you, these are often a 29, sometimes it's a 26. You're looking at a 22 millimeter when it's when it's fully deployed, which is usually longer than, you know, than most of these uh, mitral valves in terms of the post heights. So a little bit more ventricular, so you get, you know, a couple of cells. I don't always do that, and I, maybe I'll start doing that. I've kind of thought giving myself more room away from the LV outflow tract and especially for repeat procedures. Yeah. Um, to, to keep it a little bit more atrial, but I'm, I'm not sure of the right answer on that. And then and the, risk, the, the I risk of LVOT obstruction, of course, low. So what's in, that? The risk of LVOT obstruction, pretty low in these valve and valves for the most part. So it's less likely that you're going to get yourself into trouble with um, more ventricular deployment with a valve and valve. With the one exception, which is if you accidentally get a, com you know, maybe it's a little tight and then you get a commissure in the wrong spot. Because remember the, the sapien valves, anything that's extending further than 
the posts of the valve, uh, those leaflets are opening and closing, right? So unless the commish isn't directly in front of the LVOT, you should be okay. The issue here is with the permanent opening of the leaflets of the bioprosthetic valve, right? Right. I'm kind of thinking about subsequent procedures down the road and things, but I don't know. Yeah. Uh, how often are you guys closing the iatrogenic ASD? Is that a polling question first before we answer it? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> no, it's not. We didn't think to do that. I, I close um, the majority of these, if not almost all of them. I think this is not a, a 24 French or eight millimeter hole for a mitra clip that is a slit and, and has a chance of closing. I mean, you made a pretty big, you know, by the time it recoils a little, you're talking sometimes 12 millimeter holes at 11. I, I find that they stay open. So I, I close most of them with a gore device, just like you do here. Um, yeah, I that's... tend to close the minority. Um, minority, yeah. Yeah, if there's a lot of TR and they're shunning right to left, if it looks like I've torn up the septum a little more than usual, I'll close them. Yeah. But I leave most of them open and it hasn't really been an issue very often. But I don't know. I, um, I'm gonna split the difference on you two. I used to close them all um, because just felt like you made this big old 12 millimeter hole and we should I you know I there's this I, I've found that I used to do that in part because you'd see these huge v waves in the mitral in the left atrium and you think oh almighty but the truth of the matter it, it seems like the the a lot of these people have really poorly compliant left atria and I wonder if having that little pop-off hole is actually kind of good for diastolic dysfunction so I have kind of, I've kind of gone the other way, unless people have RV and not close them, unless people have RV dysfunction or uh, severe TR, right to left shunting or something like that. This guy had enough RV dysfunction that I closed it, but I, I will say that I used to be probably 85 or 90% closed and now I'm probably 75% leave open. Um, so I don't know. We've got a couple questions from the audience. Yeah. yeah, so the first question that came through is whether the default is to do general anesthesia and use TE for intraprocedural imaging guidance. We do. Yeah, so do we. Adam, you're muted. You could certainly, uh, for valve and valve, you probably could go, you know, without, without general anesthesia. And, and again, if you looked at your CT and there's no risk of LVOT obstruction and things like that, you have great landmarks for these valves, you could do it. But for everything else, uh, I think general anesthesia and TE is the way to go. I think if you did not use TE, you could do it with ice. I think it, I think it'd be a little bit, I don't know, I, I, I don't like the idea of doing blind transeptal crossing. I think you might end up in the wrong place a little bit and it's kind of, that seems a little backwards to me. So I think ice guided would be very doable. But sure. But we, what some people will do is they'll do sedation and a TE for the transeptal part and then yeah. there's just no general anesthesia. Yeah, that'd be reasonable. I'm sure that's how they do it in Germany. <laughs> you, you know, our, our primary uh, imager is German. I can, <laughs> I can very easily see that. You swallow the probe! The probe. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a question about BVF in here too, and let's get into that in a minute because I've got a case um, in that regard. So I'm gonna I'm gonna table that one for a second. In this particular guy, we also did his tri his uh, tricuspid valve. You guys ever worry about outflow track obstruction on the tricuspid? Yeah, I never have really given it any thought to be honest with you, but uh, never occurred to me. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and are you of the put the wire in the apex school or put the wire in the PA school? We've had okay. I mean, for valve and valve with the, again, post will oriented, the wire in the apex has been fine. I think it lines up with a much better angle on the apex and makes it much easier. I, I do apex. Yeah. We did our first one in the PA and it was frankly pretty challenging. I like the apex a lot more. Yeah. Do you guys all use Safari wires for everything? 
I use a confita actually. I like the confita or confider, however you say it. I like that one better. It's a little less stiff, and it's also a lot cheaper. And you think the stiff, the softer, is helpful? I like the softer. Yeah, I think it gets less wrapped up in the mitral apparatus, and um, it's just a little more forgiving in, in my mind, uh, particularly for particularly for Taber. And because I'm comfortable with it in that space, I've just used it for for mitrals and tricuspids as well. Interesting. Um, just a quick note that after the valve and valve um, on, the, on the tricuspid, the paravalvular leak direction immediately flipped, which I thought was really interesting. Um, so we like deployed it and then the intra-op TEE shows that the, the, ret the paravalvular is now retrograde. Did you close it? <laughs> I should have, no. Didn't. What a great case, that's cool. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's get into some more complicated one. Um, oh, we got uh, a question about why mitral before tricuspid and does it matter? Um, you know, I, I guess that I would just say that we, um, I tend to, you know, close the most, I mean, uh, fix the one that's most towards the outflow first and go backwards, but, and I will do aortics before mitrals and mitrals before tricuspids. Not that it comes up every day, but, I don't know. Do you guys have a feeling about that? Can we start most distal like you and work our way back aortic mitral trickles? Yeah. Yeah. By the way, did you pace on either of those? I didn't, I didn't catch if there was a you, wire there. You know, I often do not. I have started pacing some of the more complicated mitrals, but I often, I never pace our tricuspids and I often do not pace our mitrals. There's actually a question here about would you check the RV lead? I don't know if the case that you showed had a permanent pacer. Uh, yeah, I think it did. Yeah. Um, no, that's an interesting question. Uh, I know I didn't think to check the, the impedance on that. Yeah. Most people would say to check it, um, you know, shortly afterwards. Um, but, but most of the time these check out fine. There's been, rare cases when the lead impedes. Yeah, there's actually a publication. I think uh, Mayo Group did collecting from different centers that showed that the pacemaker usually tolerates this just fine. It's probably a little hard to take out if you need to though. <laughs> yeah, well. I'm sure Adam's got away. <laughs> I don't, that's tough, I bet. Um, all right, so. Here's, a, here's another case as a 59 year old. This is still valve and valve territory. So 59 year old, so young, but lots of problems. Uh, severe pulmonary hypertension, endocarditis, had, um, had a mitral valve replacement because of that. And I'm not sure why at that time he got a bioprosthetic valve. I think it, there was a question about compliance. Um, and uh, anyway, he got transferred into us with severe uh, bioprosthetic failure in the form of stenosis. He had a 31 Hancock, and then he also had a pacemaker. Um, and this is just out of the valve and valve app um, for a little uh, framework. True, true ID is 26. The interesting thing about this guy was that um, here is, are his echoes. Um, RV is not doing well. He's got really bad mitral stenosis. Um, he already had some pre-existing LVOT gradient just from the surgical valve alone, uh, about That's 20 impressive. millimeter. Say again? That's impressive. Is that, um, yeah. is that a post that looks like it's coming right across the LVOT also? That sure see that on your is a post straight across, straight across the LVOT. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. a problem. <laughs> yes, that's well, well characterized. Um, so um, I guess let's just start here. What do you, what do you want? What would you think? What's your, kind of going through your mind? Is, you guys have dealt with this before, I'm sure, at some level. This is one, um, so this is one where you got, to me, you got to do a CT scan because I see that post touching the septum on the other side there, and you have to make sure 
that you don't have a risk of LVFT obstruction here. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it kind of functionally already has some, even just with the surgical valve. So I do a CT for everyone, Adam. Do you do that? I, I do. We do them for everybody. Yeah, so I think, I think there's no, I mean, no reason not to. Yeah, and, but this, I agree, this is one where, I mean, let's say you had a, a neo-LVL tract that was prohibitive. What would you do with that? Yeah, well, I'll, get, I'll show you the CT and then let then maybe you can answer it with the question. Uh, so just another view of that post. Um, and let me see if I can find you a CT. All right, here's a CT. You can see that post very clearly straight across across the outflow track and there's just some annular sizing but um, uh, I think I've got a neo LVOT here so there's a hypothetical 29 millimeter valve 70% um, ventricular and I didn't show you the neo LVOT but you can take my word for it that it's zero yeah it looks like it it's kind of an interesting case because it's all because the RV is so big it's it's not your usual anatomy of just small anatomy. It's just because the septum is so compressed by this giant RV. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting point. Um, I think that um, before we go too much further into what we did, I was just going to use this as a takeoff to make sure everyone's on the same page with some of the vocabulary we've been using. So. This idea of outflow track obstruction and neo-LVOT specific to transcatheter valves. This is a 3D print of, a, of someone's heart um, with a sapient valve just kind of plugged into the mitral position. The leaflets of the mitral valve were not printed. But the idea here is that if you put in a sapient, this picture over here is looking down the aortic valve from the aorta into the outflow track, into the yeah, outflow track. And this side is from the atrium down into the mitral. What you can see is that you've got open cells here sticking across the uh, outflow tract, which are fine so long as they stay open. But the problem is that if you have the leaflet covering those cells, the native leaflet covering those cells or the surgical leaflet for that matter, then you really restrict the orifice. And obviously the goal is to have all those cells stay open. Um, so that, that's the predominant mechanism of outflow tract obstruction. Now in this particular case, he has a surgical post which would run right in here through the outflow tract and is not one you're going to really move short of just taking it out, which is why this becomes a real challenge is because it's not just a displaced leaflet from the surgical valve, it's the physical post of the, of the surgical valve. Um, and uh, worth noting, uh, since we kind of talked about it on the CT side, I'm not going to belabor this, you can kind of look at the reference, but you can measure the outflow tract and the neo LVOT by kind of creating a hypothetical valve and then taking a short axis of that outflow tract. Um, Adam, when you guys were, when you were at Henry Ford, you guys sort of published this uh, criteria, I believe, um, and kind of finding a cutoff in gradient of, uh, using 188 millimeters squared for a neo LVOT obviously not indexed or anything. And I think it was 30 patients or so, but what, what are your thoughts now? I know this is a couple yeah. years old. Yeah, there was still there's various cutoff points from different publications, but I, to make things simple uh, and to round things off, I start to look at things when I get less than 200. You know I mean? If I look at as, probably gradation of risk, right? Um, but but if you just want to remember one number of 200, if you got to start to think about it when you get under 200, the exact number of people could off your time. Yeah. I am. Um, so, and then I just want to point out, since I do all my own CT measurements, I have come to understand how bad, <laughs> how difficult these can be, um, right? And so like, there's a lot of fixation on an absolute number, but this is the same patient, the same valve, and... I put this one in at, as if it was exactly coplanar, so zero degree valve tilt from the annular plane. And then I measured the neo LVOT and I got 180. And I put this one in and I tilted it away from the LVOT by seven degrees. And I got a number of 252. So, and I'll tell you what, I cannot control a seven degree shift in, in the valve implantation 
uh, inside the annulus, and maybe you guys probably can do better. But um, and so the point is, there's a lot of fudge in these numbers, and and kind of holding them as as gospel is um, has made me really worried. So I actually went to 220. I've just decided there's enough play in these numbers that I want. Who knows, whatever. But I'm going to give my I'm going to build myself in some extra boundaries there. Um, to but and I, and I think that's reasonable, right? That's why I said call it 200, call it 220. But yeah. but but we have ways to deal with this, right? And, and yeah. probably the simplest way to take care of it in a normal situation with one-stop shopping would be tip to base or reverse lampoon, right? So in a valve and valve, you could just float through, electrify your wire and pull it back towards the sewing ring and slice it. And so why not go to 200 or 220? I mean, it, there's a good good amount of data now on, on a series of these tip to base lampoons that, that it does its job. Yeah, talk a little bit about, I, I think that's an important, um, it, it's important distinction from kind of the anti-grade lampoon um, and it's specific to mitral valve and valve and valve and ring because you have a physical structure that protects the aortal mitral curtain. But just talk, explain that a little bit more um, in case folks haven't seen anything about it or done it. Sure. I mean, do you want me to share my screen and show a picture of it or do you have sure. one? Yeah. Um, no, why don't you do that? I stopped sharing. Yes to the first or what? What do you want to do? You want me to Any anything you want. I think it's a it's a good time to just um, explore that a little bit more. Okay. Can you guys see my slide here? No. No. I have to share, right? Let's see if we can get it to share. Um. I want to share screen. How about now? Yep. Do you have to give me, you got it? Yep. Okay. All right, so let's see if I can get this to play here. Okay, so uh, let's go back one here, hold on. I think my computer is quite slow. Anything playing? No? Go back one more and see if it'll play, if you go forward again. All right. Okay, so I guess here are the variants of Lampoon, right? The classic retrograde technique um, where you burn through the base of the leaflet and then a snare and, and pull. We have simplified it by, by making it a transeptal procedure so you don't have to go retrograde across the aortic valve. But for valve and valves in specific and valve and rings, you can not do the traversal part. In other words, you could just float. So if you look on this picture here, you could just float right through the valve, snare the wire in the aorta, and then uh, make your flying V and, and retrograde. The, and now you can just pull on both catheters. And so what you're doing is you're pulling from uh, tip to base, does that make sense? And if you look in the LVOT on the right, so you're here in this case, there is no post in the way. This is an appropriately oriented bioprosthetic valve. You can you can use the aortic valve to, you know, just for visualization to understand where the LVOT is um, here. And so what you can see what we're doing is we're pulling back. So we're now slicing from free tip to base and the surgical sewing ring of the valve is so robust that, um, you have a backstop, so you can just pull as hard as you want and slice the leaflet that way. This is a much quicker and simpler version of Lampoon for anybody who's got a surgical valve or ring in place. So this, I think with one-stop shopping, why not, you know, anyone who's close to 200, I, I, we just, we do it this way. We, we do too. I, I pretty much do every ring and, and mitral valve and valve these days because, I don't know, it's easier to do before than after. Well, the the only we should talk a little bit about potential complications of this. The only one that I'm aware of is if you if your um, catheter across the aortic valve comes back too far, and you expose the electrified wire um, across the aortic valve, right? You can get into you can cause 
trouble that way. But other than that, I, I and I, I haven't seen that, though I have heard of one case. Um, other than that, I haven't heard of anything kind of going awry. I don't know if you have. So that's right. You have to be careful. And so if you look at this, uh, the pull from the picture on the left in the REO view, you would just have to watch carefully that you're pulling more from the transeptal side, right? So you're flying V and your two cath catheters are close to each other. And then as you pull, this is a nice slow control. This could be a 10, 12, 15 second burn. Just make sure you're you're keeping the flying V on the mitral side. Now, if you think about your case though, with a post directly in the middle, heading out the LVOT. So we only have an N of one in that uh, situation. And what we chose to do is just make two different burns. So we started on one side of the post burn. And so basically sliced the leaflet off of the post on the lateral side. Then we flipped over to the medial side, used the same exact system, burned from the medial side, sliced that part of the leaflet off of that post there and then did it and, and actually on see beautiful splitting of the leaflet uh, off of the post. Because think about this, the, the post, although it's annoying, can't be causing really bad LVOT obstruction because the leaflet's not moving in the patient right now before you do it, right? This this commissural sewing. Um, so if you could just separate the two, the two leaflets off of that post, you should be okay. And now you're left with just a post uh, in the area. There's a the question other thing from the I'm, audience, sorry. Um, question yep. about what your default fluoro angle is to make sure that you are to use when you're puncturing the anterior mitral leaflet. So just to clarify, um, in this particular scenario, you don't actually puncture through the leaflet. It's a, this is a scenario where you go, you're, you've just gone through the orifice of both valves, but I guess for specific to Antigrade lampoon, where you are puncturing the AML. What what ang general angles do you like, Adam? So we will use CT derived angles. One will be an RAO, just like this, so we know that we're pointed uh, in a in a classic antigrade lampoon manner um, towards the towards the LV through the through the base, and then we will use an LEO caudal view that is CT derived that will put us an angle that we can look that we're right at the base of A2, does that make sense? We rely on TE primarily more than the angles. Is that fair, Adam? The TE is very helpful in that situation as well, that's true. The only other thing that might be worth mentioning, by the way, for, for those who are starting here is this concept, by the way, which is balloon assisted, or for that matter, lithotripsy assisted uh, lampoon. If you are gonna burn through the base and it's a MAC case, and let's say you have a big bar of calcium across the anterior leaflet and you think that there may not be enough splay of the leaflet, it's a piece of cardboard. What we have found very helpful to increase the splay angle is to actually widen out the base first. So if you look on the left in the diagram, right, you'll get a typical traverse slice and, and then a certain splay. But if you could take a four and a half, five millimeter balloon before you do anything, you traverse and then you put a balloon in and inflate it. So you'll see, for instance, in the ring, the two pictures on the left are, are, are this would have been a reverse case, um, a reverse lampoon case now, but we were splaying out the base of A2. Uh, you can see a MAC case on the third and there's a lithotripsy balloon as an option on the one all the way on the right. And then once you've teed off the base, now when you slice, uh, we have seen much, much wider splits, by the way. Well, lithotripsy balloon. What's special about it? Yeah, so, so the only reason we tried that one or two times was to try and try and see if we could get the um, the uh, lithotripsy to sort of soften the leaflet at all. So we've done about I don't know ten or twelve now, and I'm not sure that we can tell the difference between lithotripsy and regular balloons. So for the most part, we've gone simply to to regular balloons, but but it is an option if you want to try it. Going back to tip to base lampoon, there's a question about how you ensure that the flying V doesn't move off center, for instance, slipping into the commissure. Right, let's go back a slide so we can look at those again. So that's basically controlled by the steerable guiding catheter that's in the left atrium. So whichever catheter you use, uh, in this case, this happens to be a Nagari, but with your TEE guidance, you will basically put that over 
A2 or in a bioprosthetic leaflet, obviously that you wouldn't call it A2, you would just call it the leaflet of the bioprosthetic valve that's in the LVOT. Um, but that you want to use as your fulcrum to make sure. So because your pull is going to tend to be slide from lateral to medial, right? Because you're transeptal and, and of course the septum is a medial structure. So you want to make sure that that nagari is bent and is directly over A2. Yeah. Adam, what size balloon do you use for the balloon assisted? What diameter? It's typically typically a four and a half coronary balloon, like a yeah. four and a half, twenty, forty. Try it. Yeah, I think you'll I think you'll like it. The splits are um, for sure wider. Nice. The um, just on that point. And if you're going to do a max case, go ahead. Go for it. You're going to do a max case what? So sometimes you see that bar of calcium, right, that comes straight across. So we make sure we burn basal to that. So we traverse, put the four and a half balloon in, spread it, and then when we cut through, um, we seem to get a bigger split. So th that's where I think it's probably the most useful. Because it's, all these uh, others would be taken care of. It's basically, it's like, um, you know, it's, it's the Batman concept with Lampoon, right? I mean, that, that idea that you're gonna kind of just keep dilating the, the anterior mitral leaflet and then eventually make that dilation so big that you put the you put the valve right through that hole and then either split or whatever the anterior mitral leaflet but it's just one step less than that I suppose uh, do you do you have trouble getting the balloon to to cross the anterior leaflet no yeah sometimes we'll take a, a, a two millimeter coronary balloon first and, and just dilate it a little and then put the four in it and if you're going to use a lithogypsy balloon for sure, you're going to need a coronary balloon. Yeah. Sometimes you get out of the rotoblader. <laughs> we haven't done that one yet, but but let me know how it goes. <laughs> um, There's another question about whether lampoon is harder to perform in heavy leaflet calcification, and any strategies for dealing with that. So, we have never had a case where we were able to traverse that we failed to lacerate. You do need a calcium free um, spot to traverse, but once you've made the flying V, if your catheters, if your flying V is made correctly, if your catheters are where they need to be, if you're infusing glucose to, to um, concentrate the charge, you should be able to get through if there's a big bar of calcium on the anterior leaflet that you're trying to slice through, it will take a longer pull. It may take a little bit stronger pull, but you will be able to get through. I will say we, the only time we've ever traversed where we couldn't slice was, was when we just couldn't snare the wire. In the old retrograde days, boy, uh, le retrograde lampoon, I feel like you used to search for that wire in the left atrium for an hour at times. And I, I have, that's been the only failure mode I've encountered following traversal, though I will say that sometimes I'm not so sure that I cut it with electricity so much as I cut it with my biceps. Um, all right, let's go, let's go back to the case for a second. We can pop back to your slides at, uh, sure. as, it, uh, as we go along. Um, there was another question, um, if you guys want to tackle this while I'm getting the slides uh, up and going again. Yeah, so the question is, do you use any other parameters other than a neo LV, LVOT area less than 180 or 200 or 220 um, and the aortomitral angle to predict the risk of LVOT obstruction? So the, the data on the aortomitral angle is um, harder to find. You know, I've heard 120 degrees. I don't know if you guys have heard the same number, but I have found that to be less reliable than, than, the, than the neo LVOT based on, on CT, on 3D uh, reconstructions using three meds here or equivalent product. I would let you know that the other parameter that we do use is this concept called the skirt neo LVOT, right? In other words, um, the skirt of the transcatheter valve does not open and close, right? The internal skirt. So if your ventricle is so small 
but there's just not even enough room for the 12 millimeter skirt, uh, then, then you can get into trouble. So we will simulate a 12 millimeter valve placed in the most atrial portion that the valve would be. Forget the rest of the valve and then try and see what that Neo LVOT is. And it's the same number of 200. If the skirt Neo LVOT is 200 or less, then you have to do something to make more room for the internal skirt. Does that make sense? So that's the second number that we look at. I always measure the distance between the struts of the bioprosthetic valve and the septum. It's kind of a poor man's Neo LVL flutract. And if it's more than seven millimeters, you're pretty sure you're going to be fine. Okay. Uh, sure. I never, I no longer use the aorta mitral angle at all because I just never knew exactly what to do with it. Um, I guess the only other thing that I do measure is I measure the length length of the anterior mitral leaflet, and I do compare that to the diameter of the LVOT. We had one case where the neo LVOT was great, and unexpectedly the person developed of flow track obstruction quite severe um, and um, fairly, you know, for a moment anyway, fairly catastrophic. And it seemed like probably what had happened was we had torn a cord a somewhere along the line and that anterior mitral leaflet, rather than being tethered kind of on top of the sapien valve, had just been able to sort of retroflex completely open into the outflow track. Was this a ring? It was in a ring, yeah. Yeah. And it actually got a lot better by just crossing, you know, we got an impella because the guy's dying and whatever. And I think just the process of going through the outflow track kind of displaced that leaflet back down. Um, and he got better almost immediately. But, uh, and what'd you do finally? Sure. That's dynamic. Uh, yeah, what did we do finally? We left it, well, so first we didn't recognize that it got better simply because of traversal. We thought like, oh, the impella's doing everything is amazing. And it took us a few, it probably took a day or two to realize kind of on retrospect um, what had transpired and then what we had done. And then we took the impella out and he did fine. I guess you could argue that he's subject to having that happen again. And maybe we should have done a post implant laceration, um, which we did not do, but this was a number of years ago and I, it just wasn't something I was doing or thinking about then. So that, that dynamic LV outflow tract obstruction from the floppier long leaflet uh, can occur and certainly has been, been written about and published. And all you really need to do is split the tip. So what's happening is, is right, it, it's the outflow and it's the high velocity that's pulling it over as Venturi effect. So if you could just get a little split in the leaflet, you actually it will now, it will flatten against the cage and stay away. So you can do a that reverse lampoon or that tip to base lampoon through the cage and all you're going to do is pull that electrified wire back to the cage of the sapien valve and just split the tip and, and that should take care of it. And and for that rather than neo LV outflow tract I think the the um, tip to flexion point of the anterior leaflet is the measurement we rely on and if you have a, a leaflet length greater than 24, 25 millimeters, then they're high risk. And those are the patients where we ought to be doing lampoons. Mm, that's interesting. I agree. I think that's the correct number. Yeah. I've always just used longer than the outflow track, the cross section of the outflow track, but 24, 25 is a number you've seen reproducibly or whatever it is higher risk. I do think it's laxity of the core does also factor in, right? Because yeah. I mean, if it's long, but it, you know, but we can. I, I agree with you, though, Jamie. I think we can disrupt the tethering of that, and it becomes this wildly hingy valve. And so, in our series, we found that twenty four twenty five was was the number. Hmm. And I and I saw Adam's publication was the same. It's kind of a nice confirmation. Yeah. All right. Well, in this guy, we ended up doing an alcohol septal ablation to just try and try and do uh, you. <laughs> feels like a while ago that we talked about him but he anyway we debulked there a little bit um and uh and so i just thought this would be a good opportunity to talk about how you guys do your septal ablations um particularly for folks who don't have you know actual hokum um any any sort of tips and tricks that you've developed over time anything that you're 
that you really hang your hat on? Right. You know, for this case, I would have been tempted to do a soft mitral valvular plasty on him with an undersized balloon just to decompress his RV. Hmm. And I, you might have really opened up that outflow tract. And, you know, there's all the paranoia about creating severe MR or AI or anytime we balloon these bioprosthetic valves. But I think that comes from an era when we didn't understand that the true ID was so different than the labeled ID, hmm. the labeled OD really. And we were markedly oversizing the balloons that people were using on these bioprosthetic valves. And I think if you stay somewhat smaller than the true ID, it's safe to balloon these a little bit. And, and um, instead of a guy with severe pulmonary hypertension and an enormous RV, you might have really decompressed them by doing that. Hmm, that's interesting. But, um, um, and, and maybe dilate the LV a little bit too, although this person looked like that septum was pretty thick, right? I thought it was fairly thick, yeah. yeah. Um, I forget the exact measurement, but if you are going to go to to alcohol, um, I don't know any 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 lessons learned or any kind of pitfalls to watch out for. These septals are usually smaller than the the true hypertrophs, so if we're doing true hypertrophs, they often have these giant septals that have that have systolic compression and it's pretty easy to know where to go and we use more alcohol to obliterate them. Where here they tend to be smaller septals and we don't use as much alcohol, um, but they're, they tend to be more one and a half, two millimeter vessels at the largest and, and usually two cc's is plenty for whatever we're doing, usually less than that and, and just try and look and see under echo that it is a proc directly across from the struts of the bioprosthetic valve. Um, I see you've got an echo here labeled Definity. We tend to not use Definity, but just contrast, inject contrast through the balloon, and that usually lights up the septum pretty well. Oh, you can see it on echo? Yeah, we can see it, yeah, right, it lights up the, echo, the septum on echo really well, just putting some contrast in, and just make sure it's targeted right across from the struts of the bioprosthetic valve. That's interesting. You know, it's interesting, Brian, you've confirmed my, what I've thought too. We've had trouble, frankly, finding the septals for these because some of these people just have a few tiny small ones or you can't even see any. The first septal you see is actually too far down the myocardium and maybe because they're not true hypertrophs, right? And so they're right. just not, they're just not big enough. And so we have struggled. Um, that's my only advice is that, uh, you know, you have to look hard for, the vessel that is actually supplying the neo LVOT, the septum there, and sometimes it's not. And we found them off. off yeah, it's a harder procedure than the true hypertroph, I think, because we tend up going after a couple little hair-like septals with little tiny amounts. Which of is contrast. which is why we did we did move to radio frequency ablation about two years ago. Um, I think maybe 2018 we started. I think we've done six cases of bipolar radio frequency ablation, we, we call it the scorpion procedure, and we kind of just, this way they can get the catheters right where they think the thick part of the muscle is. You know. you have EP do that, or you do it? We do, we've had the EP guys do it, yeah. I will say that, An interesting. Uh, sorry. I just gotta note that your septals are all relative. Your hair-like septals are ones that Lombardi will tell me he can do cart through and put a 4-0 balloon retrograde through that sucker into the RCA. So sure. we, we've got very different, you know, um, there's there's flagellation involved if you can't find the right septal. And then, look at that, so it's, it's got to be a quarter millimeter. That thing's huge. <laughs> there's a question here about um, if you were advising an early experience operator that, um, you know, because of the technical expertise required to do Lampoon, would you recommend that they sort of start out with alcohol septal ablation as a default for managing LVOT obstruction risk? No. <laughs> I think you gotta learn, you, you gotta learn to burn. And then- uh, yeah, I think it's, it's a good question. I th certainly alcohol septal ablation is something that people are comfortable with. And unless you're doing a lot of these, we don't, and you're and if you're doing max or rings, then alpha tract obstruction is a big deal that you, that we encounter frequently. 
But for valve and valves only, we don't see it that often. And so I think for operators who are just doing valve and valves and they didn't want to learn lampoon, they could use alcohol septal ablation as a strategy they're comfortable with. And if there's not good anatomy for an alcohol ablation, then refer to a center who does lampoon. Because uh, I don't know that everyone who's doing this needs to become expert in, in um, lampoon. I, maybe you disagree, uh, Adam. Um, but I think there are a number of centers who won't do rings and won't do max, and, and that's, that's a reasonable strategy. And then if you do alcohol, the key is to wait a month and then repeat the CT scan and make sure it's sufficient. Yeah. Just to end that case, because I, I got bored of that case. We did, we, we did wait three weeks. We did lampoon two, tip to base. Um, it was kind of early on. I don't know if you saw it. It was not our perfect, most perfectly done one, but it worked fine. And, uh, and then he got a valve and valve and did quite well. Um, I, I would say that I actually think that the sum of the parts of alcohol and lampoon together are clearly bigger than either one on its own. Like there's, you know, not having that hyperdynamic septum, I think is, is really beneficial. And I've, I've started for people where I'm on the fence or nervous about them, particularly the more high risk scenarios, not, not really valve and valves. Um, I, I've just started taking to doing both. Um, though I will say that at least for us, we've had probably 40% pacemaker rates for, for alcohol. I mean, it's not, it's not trivial. Um, and you got to make people wait for a month and there's, there are definite downsides to the alcohol as well. But. It's probably higher than 40%. Usually I'm thinking about the max in particular, because that's where we end up doing the most alcohol. Yeah. Uh, for those patients, they usually have an aortic valve already. Right. right. And severe calcium. And then our pacemaker rates like 95. Right. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, yeah. It's just part of their bionic status. Yes. All right. Let, I got another one for you. This is a 46 year old. She had had, um, she had a partial AV canal with situs and versus and blah, blah, blah. Most notably, she has an interrupted IVC. All of her prior surgeries had been um, so at, a, at a famous center in the, middle, in the north middle of the country. And, um, and in 2002, she had a very complicated surgery um, and they put in a bioprosthetic valve, a mosaic 27, not really sure why, not a mechanical valve, and then told her she could never have another surgery again, uh, another sternotomy specifically. And, um, and so here's bioprosthetic valve, a young person, she's a school teacher, um, and an interrupted IVC. And so this one, I guess, is mostly just an access question for you guys about how to do this or not do this or whatever. Um, let me see what I got for you. Here's her echo. Um, so pretty severe MR at this point, symptomatic. Um, Wait a minute. Here's her CT. Right, so, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So let's talk about transeptal from the uh, from the neck. Yes. Or transapical. We'd go transapical for this one. Or I'd send it to you. I'd send it to Washington. For you, so you do a right thoracotomy for the right atrium. Well, we just go transap. We would just go transapical. Oh, to, to the to the RV. I, I mean to the L. Oh, you're right. The LV. Sorry, right, right. Old school. Oh, yes. So you could you could do the. There's some experience with doing the transeptal from the leg, and then of course uh, once you're across, right, you could. Um, you know, grab the wire from the neck and pull it up, right? So you've kind of done what you're comfortable with, right? And then gotten the proximal end and pulled it up the neck, and now you have the transeptal from the from the neck if you want to try it that way. Well, but you couldn't go from the legs to an interrupted IVC for the original transeptal, sure. Yeah. In this case, yeah, this is literally a cut off of her IVC is right there under the right atrium. Um, here is her kind of funky anatomy. Um, tricusp, the mitral valve there, long outflow tract, and aortic valve. Um, very kind of unusual. 
And I, I will just, uh, I mean, this is a bit of a one-off and so whatever, but I'll just say that we, this is one where we did actually a, a, a cadaveric practice um, and uh, on how to get across the septum from the neck. And we did, turns out we did what you do all the time, which is use a steerable catheter and electrified wire, um, which uh, maybe you stole that idea from us. I don't know, but um, yeah, there you go. Um, but, but we went from. I, I have my I have my sources at your institution. <laughs> We're always telling you what not to do. Um, <laughs> so we went with the directs from the from the uh, right yeah. IJ and then electrified a wire and and sort of the transcaval idea of telescoping catheters, um, which worked out which worked out okay. Um, so just kind of an interesting case. I don't know. Trying to think and you externalized it out the. No. We went out the aortic valve just because it was such a funny. Uh, things were just so unusually shaped and oriented. That's an amazing case. Did you do that? I'm just it. Yeah. So this is the one where I wanted to talk about balloon valve fracture because here's our valve at the. Oh, sorry, that just skipped right ahead. Um, so here's our valve at the end. Um, we clearly have a. A, a narrowing at the at the annulus um so yeah. i came up earlier and let's just dive into that are you guys worried about balloon valve fracture have you seen anything bad happen from the mitral position or not yeah i have not we, we've sort of been fracturing anything 25 or less at the on the valve if the bioprosthetic valves that's small that's small okay. so that was one of the major it was probably the major criticism of our our review of the sts database was that the mean gradient across the entire population was seven yeah. so that and a lot of people said that's too high that so that was the major criticism um and that raised my awareness of the possibility of trying to optimize these hemodynamics so we have been fracturing more so far, I have not seen any complications. I haven't really heard of any complications. Um, it seems like it's a pretty pretty doable procedure and patients do well with it. Yeah, I agree. We've been, I, I've actually gotten a little more aggressive. I'll balloon valve fracture any prosthesis where the ID is less than 28 because the 28 is the biggest true balloon. So if you get bigger than 28, you, I don't know what to do. I've tried, I tried once um, because I, guy had a, a huge valve I can't remember but it was a young person quite hyperdynamic and seemed like we didn't have the result we wanted and I tried once doing a pair of 16 true balloons and to see if I could get like to 30 millimeters which did not work for me um, so if you look at the cross-sectional area of two 16s so if you do the area yeah the, the area of two 16s is dramatically less then, then you're like 24 true. Should have called you. Um, and th this is, I did two fellowships and my first, <laughs> my first fellowship, we used double balloons all the time. I see. And then I got to my second and uh, Don Bame, I was like, well, we, why don't we use two balloons? He's like, do the math on that. And I went and did it and <laughs> sure enough, kind of makes sense. Yeah. All right, so if I need to get to 30, what should I use two of? Oh, they're big. There's a formula, and it's uh, they're big. They're oh, they're at least 18s, right? If I maybe, I think you got to do the math 18. and figure it out, you know, and look at the area, you know, get out your pi r squared and and see what your area is to to get there. That's the worst thing anyone. Yeah, but the 28, the tw you are. It's interesting, Jamie. The 28 um, does a fine job, and so you're right. So you could crack anything with that up until I guess the 27. It's a little harder. You know, it's harder to crack when the when the balloon is only slightly oversized, right? So you got to go a little bit higher pressure. And so you may run, you know, and it's a little harder to do with bigger balloons, the 28 more than the others. So you might rupture a balloon or two. But. You know, what's the name of the of the big, long balloon like Atlas that all the pediatric devices? Atlas Gold is the is Yeah, there. they do the Atlas Gold. Does it come bigger? It does, doesn't it? No. Or, no, I don't believe so. I, I have it. I have searched for a bigger Kevlar balloon and I have not found one. 
Um, Tom Jones is our big ACHD guy here, and we have all his toys. And I went shopping through his stuff and looking through their catalog, and I couldn't find anything. We've Do been you, doing. Um, oh, go ahead. Uh, there's a question from the audience. Do you BVF pre or post implant? I do. I do. Well, I've been pre. doing it post in for the mitrals. I have found a higher incidence of balloon rupture when I've tried to fracture before. I, I don't know why. I don't see that with the aortic. So, uh, so I just switched to doing it post for the mitrals. Yeah. We uh, yeah. even on the aortics, I finally gave in and started doing it post. Mm -hmm. I think Adam and I were among the unique who started fracture first, but I said uncle. I'm still there. I'm You're still, still fracture first? Yep. I mean, I'm, obviously you get there are scenarios like this one where you're like, oh, that's not as big as I want it to be and I'll frac you know, fracture after. But most of the time I plan on well, fracture. You know, the other issue of valve and valve that I've been kind of hypersensitive to lately, both on the mitral and the aortic side, is I think when we significantly on oversize the transcatheter valve compared compared to the prosthesis and under expand these valves we really do get pinwheeling and that predisposes us to thrombosis of these valves and and halt and and more problems um and we've and even with bicuspids where they don't open up uh, fully circular i think we we've seen some problems with that so I, I, we've been a lot more aggressive about fully expanding these valves lately I mean, if you weren't going to fracture this one, right, you might have taken a 26 and fully right. opened it at least. Yeah. I think that would have been the right call without fracturing. And then yeah. we always, we often put an extra volume for the mitrals to try and make sure that we're flared. Yeah. Agreed. Um, all right. We got uh, this just so, just so we don't show only only great cases I, I wanted to just I notice all you show is 40 year old women this is Isn't that weird population. Uh, it's really unusual uh, it's true but um, they just happen to be some of the most unusual cases I guess this one um, is a slow motion train wreck that is absolutely avoidable and it's just worth seeing um, it's just worth seeing. And the question just came up, any benefit trying to land zero for valve and valve? And I guess I'll show you the downside of trying to land zero. I, I will say that I do all, so this is a, an epic, it's nearly invisible. So that's do, a little bit tougher, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I do all of my complicated cases with the same surgeon who, and we have a, I just, I realized this case in particular helped me realize that I'm used to a certain cadence and I expect things to happen in a very specific way. And, and this was on me that I didn't, I was working with a newer surgeon and I didn't communicate well. And that's so important for people kind of getting into this space. And she just, it, it just, the inflation just kind of stopped here. And I don't know why. And I was trying to do a little push, push where you push on the wire and you push on the catheter to get it to be a little more coaxial. But I also expected the inflation to continue and we just weren't coordinated and boy did that that this just sucks um and so you can see it obviously yeah. trying to get a little too cute on the deployment angle and on the deployment position and then once we've fallen out she starts to deploy and we just weren't we didn't communicate well and there's the pop as you can see and so now it's now it's free floating yeah. and um and these these suck and it was free floating and it ended up kind of um, landing in front of the, her prosthetic aortic valve a number of times. She got quite sick. I just deployed this one on my own as the surgeon was um, starting to get uh, access um, to the LV apex to get this first one out. And at the end, you know, she got a mitral valve. We got this one out, but it was a, it was a, a number of days in the hospital and you know they're they're never there's only there's only ever the first problem it's never the last problem with these sorts of scenarios so just wanted to own the fact that it's not always perfect um, any thoughts any any uh, helpful criticism about how to do that better or 
anything? No, I mean, every day is a school day and we all have our, our days where stuff like this happens. Um, it's good of you to show it. Um, you know, that said, the, the incidence of valve embolization was not just less than 1% in the STS registry, it was uh, extraordinarily rare. So I, I don't think people should generally be too, you know, f scared by this complication. It's pretty rare. Yeah, yeah. I don't mean to scare yeah. people off. I do think that as we aim, as I try and get closer and closer to that zero implant, zero atrial implant, you know, you this is what you this is the the risk of that. Yeah, I'm a chicken shit. I don't like that zero apical implant stuff. <laughs> Fair enough. You might just be the smartest of all of us. I don't know. Um, all right. Well, we're we're just about out of time. Um, I we didn't even get into any rings. We just spent our whole time on valve and valve. Any, um, I guess I'll just, I guess I'll just ask you, Adam, for the tip to base lampoon um, with an incomplete ring. Do you think about it differently? I don't. I don't think I would do it. I, I think you run the risk of of injury to the aortometric curtain. I think it has to be a complete ring. Okay. So. There's also a final question from the audience. If you have um, a plenty of space in the neo LVOT, what would make you choose a 26 versus a 29 S3 if the patient's borderline? I think that would depend on the true inner diameter of the valve for valve and valve. Um, again, I think Brian already stated the pinwheeling is an issue. So if you're getting an internal diameter of 24 or something, then, then taking a 29, if you're not going to fracture, can lead to some issues. So I think it's a combination. I would always go bigger in the nitro, assuming that you're going to get the valve open close to its, close to its diameter. Is that fair? So you want to get the valve to nominal. And either either by sizing it consistent with the internal diameter of the of the bioprosthesis or by fracturing into whatever valve gets you there. Yeah. Um, all right. Cool. Well, I, I I had I was very ambitious. I made I made nine cases, which we uh, will be here till midnight. Um, <laughs> All right, I, I think we're gonna close it down. It's it's 10.30 uh, East Coast time and I've kept everyone uh, past their bedtime. So um, I, I just wanna, um, I thought I just saw another question come through. Well, I just wanted to thank you guys so much, uh, Adam, Brian, Christine, uh, all people I look up to and really um, you know lean on to help me understand what I should be doing. And, and I um, just, I'm really thankful that you're in this space and and here to show us what to do. And so thank you so much for, for being present and, and here with us. And uh, I learned a lot and I hope everyone else did too. Fun evening, Jamie. Thanks for doing it. Of course. Yeah, thanks. Good night. Thanks. It's great. All right. Bye guys.